Day four was a day for the royals. We saw the King of Clay in action, and we also saw the Queen of, well, just about everything. in Paris with the trophy here. Well, hello and welcome to the Wimbledon Evening Show presented by Jaguar. Today, all eyes were on world number one, Iga Sviantec, as she looked to continue her remarkable run of wins this season. But there was more attention to be had over on court number two, just behind me, as the colourful character Nick Kyrgios was back in action once again. But day four wasn't just about those two faces. There were plenty more stories to be heard from all around the ground. Good morning from Wimbledon. Welcome to the championships underneath a cloudy sky in southwest London. A mixture of sunshine and cloud today. Forecast later on, not too clever. The fourth seed muscles her way into the third round here at Wimbledon. I want to thank all the Spanish people. I know I'm seeing the Spanish flag over there. Muchas gracias y os espero el siguiente día. The double champion is through. Sitter pass looks very comfortable on grass. And that was a mightily impressive performance from the world number five. I have to say it was a great match today. I'm, you know, I'm not a Brit, but I really felt the love of the, of the crowd and that pushed me uh, the limits. Katie Bolter is a big match player. This for the win of her life. How good was that from Britain's Katie Bolter, who's knocked out last year's finalist? Oh my God, I've got absolutely no words right now. I'm literally shaking that the crowd was unbelievable. So thank you so much for getting me through that. Oh, Game oh, six. advances. <laughs> Done it, unbelievable. <laughs> Well, welcome to Centre Court once again. Welcome once more to Rafa Nadal and Ricardo Barrancas. This is the man they have come to see. Closes it out in style. Not his finest performance, but he does enough, as all the great ones do. I didn't play much uh, on grass for the last three years, so uh, every day is, uh, is uh, an opportunity to, to improve and today I'm through, so that's given me the chance to keep going, so very happy for that. If you guys watched yesterday, you'll recognise this chap, Nick McCarville. He's back once again to take us through his thoughts from day four. It's been a great day, although we have just paused because heaven's literally opened. <laughs> you can see the covers on behind us. We've managed to stay dry though, Nick. Um, I'm ready to talk about what happened today. Let's start then. Court one, Igor Sviantek and Leslie Kirkhoff 
She was pushed, wasn't she, the world number one? She sure was, and I don't think anyone would have expected Leslie Kirkov, a lucky loser. That means she lost in qualifying. She gets a spot in the main draw. She pushes the world number one, especially when Sviantec had won those 36 matches in a row. But I actually think this is a good thing for Sviantec because she's been so in the zone, so in form, that uh, Roland Garros title coming into Wimbledon, she was pushed today. Drops that second set, um, had to find her best, and actually maybe had to find the win without her best. Comes through 36. Seven matches in a row now, Rach. That is the longest streak since Martina Hingis in 97, and she's safely into round three. It's great that more history is being made during these championships yeah. as well. Well, a little bit of history, centre court. Katie Volter, only her second time on centre court, and she has a massive upset on the books there. Karolina Pliskova, the second time she's defeated her in as many weeks and on centre. That's a massive moment for not only Katie, but for British tennis. Oh, it's huge. You know, and yesterday, disappointing, right? Raducanu going out, Andy Murray as well. But Katie Bolter revealing after the match that she had just lost her grandma in the last few days, playing with her heart out there on centre court. She beat, as you said, Plushkova at Eastbourne last week. But what a stage to do it on. The Cathedral of Tennis, centre court, and as the home hope, I mean, I got chills. I'm an American here, obviously visiting for Wimbledon, but I think she really sent some seismic shakes through the country because people love their Wimbledon summer tennis, but also through the women's draw. That's a big upset. Plushkova was the reigning finalist, and Bolter now gets Harmony Tan, the player that took out Serena Williams. Nick, can you just kick the door wide open? Yeah. <laughs> Boom, it's wide open, guys. Yeah, it is, certainly. <laughs> Let's stick with the men's straw then. Nadal is in action and didn't have it all his way, did he? No, he didn't, and he didn't in the first round either. And I think for Rafael Nadal, coming off that 14th uh, French Open, 22nd major, he's halfway to the calendar slam. He's slowly making his way to more history, but you're always going to hit bumps along the way. Today, Ricardo Barrancas is a former junior top player, took a set from him, but Rafa comes through, and like Sviantec, a win is a win. Rafa's going to happy to get, to get through into the third round, and on he marches towards more, more history. Nick Kyrgios on court number 12, up against uh, Filip Krajnovic. This one is always entertaining. Well, it was tipped to be a tough test for the Aussie, but he swept his opponent aside with his extraordinary display of ball hitting, even if he did say so himself. Compared to your first round match, just what was so different for you out there today? Um, I mean, obviously nerves, I think, you know, just getting a... Uh, Getting over the line in that first round was massive. Um, but, you know, I've been playing some really good tennis over the last month, so I was really surprised, you know, the way I played the other day. You know, it wasn't great, but, you know, there's a lot of positives. You know, I didn't play anywhere near my best and got through it. And today, obviously, you know, I was kind of in my zone, just great body language, just played well. And, you know, I just wanted to remind everyone that I'm pretty good. Well, that court then drew a lot of attention, as it always does with Nick Kyrgios, but he's now set up another matchup uh, in the next round with Stefanos Tsitsipas, which is a great matchup. Oh, absolutely. And Kyrgios, obviously, less than 90 minutes on court, some sparring in the media room, but I think he let his tennis do the talking. That's what's most important. And also, three and one against Tsitsipas, including just a couple weeks ago in Halle on grass. I'm going to tip Nick in this one, but we're ready. We've got some blockbusters now. Pop the popcorn. We're ready for round three. Kyrgios sees pass. I can't wait for it. I can't wait either. Nick, thank you so much for no sharing worries. your thoughts. Thanks and for having me. He's now pulled his hamstring after that door <laughs> yeah. being kicked wide open. So I'll go and let you get some ice. Thanks, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's great to get Nick's thoughts on some of the major headlines, but here are some of the other things you may have missed. And we have an intruder on the court. And a little is that a wagtail? I don't know. Well, it's gone from one end of the court to the other. Minor amusement to start. Approaching 11 o'clock in the morning here, but of course, who am I to speculate as to what is in that gentleman's glass or his beverage of choice? As he throws the ball up and reaches, we hear the, the grunt. There we go. <laughs> there we go. You're supposed to grunt when you actually hit the ball when there's effort. How about that? I'm not sure he's been in the queue because that is an impressive look to muster up. Definitely need a mirror. She's gone the and wrong Karen way. <laughs> has not realised that you're meant to come out of that door. Ooh. How would you describe them? Uh, nasty looking, potentially. Yeah. Go away. Yeah, that requires some concentration, doesn't it? She has done well. 
both Jamie Murray and Joe Salisbury, number one in the world in doubles. Jamie Murray was number one in the world, so maybe you might want to push that guy off the balcony there, Joe Salisbury. <laughs> Regain the number one position. Just kidding. What pizza? The young man's <laughs> brought a pizza along for Iga's fiance. It's Murphy's been working on his reactions as well. <laughs> it's not just his outfit that's sharp. <laughs> Look at Love that. Him. Taken in style. He's done it. Unbelievable. How big is that win? Yeah, it was easy, wasn't it? It was. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, as you know, Centre Court behind me is celebrating its 100th year this year. And during that time, it has seen some blockbuster matchups. And I managed to get a sit down with a sports writer from The Athletic, Charlie Eccleshare, in the museum, in the library, which is well over the other side of the championship. And he managed to take me through one of those sporting rivalries. Well, Charlie, as it's celebrating 100 years, we're going to go on a trip back down memory lane. First rivalry I want to speak about is Bjorn Borg, John McEnroe, and I want you to tell people who aren't particularly aware of how iconic that rivalry was. Yeah, well, obviously, I wasn't there to experience it firsthand, but it was, as I was growing up and getting into tennis, it was this sort of fabled rivalry that I remember being told about, the sort of fire of John McEnroe, this young brattish american and the ice of bjorn borg the ice cool swede who was just the toast of wimbledon you know this was the this he was the guy and coming into that final in 1980 i think john mackerel was very divisive a lot of people thought this guy is not very wimbledon you know he was shouting at umpires he was getting angry all of this thing they liked their champions a bit more polite a bit more measured like bjorn borg and even their tennis styles were so different and contrasting. John McEnroe was serve volley at the net, at the net, rushing at you. Bjorn Borg was a baseliner. And going into that 1980 final, he's on for his fifth straight title. And he's playing John McEnroe. And they play out this unbelievable match that becomes really the benchmark for tennis. It goes to a fourth set. This epic, epic tie break that goes on and on. I mean, that's the bit that you, you always see. That's the most famous part of the match. Anyway, McEnroe wins it, keeps himself in the match, and you think, well, he's got the momentum. And somehow, Bjorn Borg comes back and wins the fifth set to take his fifth title in a row. Yeah. They come back the next year, and McEnroe does finally win. He's won it, he's won it. And then Borg retires soon after. And McEnroe always says that was kind of actually the worst thing for McEnroe because he needed, he needed that adversary to get him to his best. And I think that's why that rivalry has been immortalised because there was no period where it tailed off. It stayed at this incredible level. Um, so I think for a lot of people it will always be the benchmark of a great sporting rivalry. And individually as well, how do you think both of those players changed the games respectively? Well, I think Borg showed that you could win Wimbledon from the back of the court. You know, he, was, he would routinely win French Open, the French Open and Wimbledon, which, to be fair, has still remained a really difficult thing to do. But he showed there was another way of winning here. Borg was maybe tennis's first sort of rock star. But I think John McEnroe as well had that kind of crossover appeal that we've seen a few people have since, but I think they, between them, they did elevate tennis and kind of made it quite cool. Bjorn Borg certainly did, you know, in, in that feeler gear that he wears, the kind of, you know, the very short shorts, the headband, all of that. McEnroe wasn't cool in the same way, but he was very, very captivating. And I think that really brought tennis to the mainstream. And was your highlight of their rivalry in 1980? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, probably because it was before my time, so I, did, I haven't seen tons of their other matches, but I think even for tennis aficionados who might want to sound cool and different by saying, no, actually, they played in the Stuttgart Open in 1978, and that was better. I think, realistically, that was kind of the high-water mark of that rivalry. 
Well, as we're nearing the end of our show, we want to move your attention to tomorrow and day five, and a few things we feel you should be keeping your eye on. First up, Britain's Heather Watson is back in action for a fifth straight day on the bounce, and that's because her first two matches, they were suspended due to fading lights. And if she progresses to the fourth round here, it'll be the furthest she's ever got in the singles draw. Now let's move on to our 2018 champion. Can you remember who that was? Angelique Kerber. Well, she's playing pretty well this year on grass, so keep your eye and see how far she can progress in this fortnight. Now let's move on then to the young Spaniard in Carlos Alcaraz. He is progressing nicely in this tournament and in his own words, he said he's feeling more comfortable on grass. We're excited to see how he gets on against Oscar Otter in the next round. Well, that is it then from day four here in southwest London. We hope you guys are loving all the action and we'd love to hear from you as well. So get in touch using the Wimbledon socials. Well, that's it from us today. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.